All right, folks, so today we're gonna finally get through this last set of anxiety-related disorders by talking about the section uh, on trauma and stressor-related disorders. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, I know that some of you have been emailing me uh, about when the paper's gonna be due. I know it says uh, it's due today, uh, the day that I'm recording this, but uh, it's not due today, it's not due uh, this, this Wednesday. Uh, because we haven't really talked about it. So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity here just to start the video out by talking about uh, some of the expectations uh, of the paper and then I'll give you a soft due date uh, for when that paper will be due. <clears throat> so this next paper is really asking you to look at a particular disorder in depth, um, but I find papers that are just, you know, writing on post post-traumatic stress disorder or OCD, I find those pretty boring. Uh, you're just kind of giving me information uh, that I already know. I don't know that it necessarily is doing uh, too much for you. It is giving you an opportunity to dig into some things. Uh, but for the most part, um, the disorders that you, that you might would write on are basically I'm, I'm covering them in class. So, uh, of course, you know, we don't talk about them at super length, uh, but you're not really doing much more work. So what you're going to do instead is you're going to take one of these disorders uh, that we've talked about or a disorder that we haven't talked about, uh, keeping in mind that, I'm, that you're only allowed to use Axis one disorders. That is to say, no personality disorders, no autism, uh, none of these things that are kind of just endemic uh, to who the person is, uh, is, is what we're talking about when we talk about Axis two disorders, uh, but things like uh, schizophrenia, things like anxiety, all the disorders that we've talked about and we'll talk about um, sexual disorders, dissociative disorders, uh, those type of things, even though we haven't talked about them yet, those are all fair game. Uh, the only axis one disorder that you can't do uh, is depression, um, and that's because we've covered that in the previous test, we covered that uh, in the previous section, um, and we also did the important work, or some of the important work, um, on culture and uh, identity that I'm going to ask you to be doing in this paper, so a lot of that uh, even would have been done for you. So what I want you to do in choosing one of these Axis one disorders um, is you're going to take that disorder and you're going to think about it in terms of a perspective from a culture or identity that you yourself um, identify with. So what does that mean? That means rather than just writing, say, uh, a paper on post-traumatic stress disorder, what this paper is going to be on is, if I were writing it, maybe something like post-traumatic stress disorder in uh, black folks, or post-traumatic stress disorder in men, or post-traumatic stress disorder um, in folks in their 30s, in a, in a 30s age group, right? And so we're really looking at some uh, culture or age group and then thinking about how that disorder would both look on that person and also any different terms of any different types of treatment, any different types of therapeutic interaction that would need to happen for this to be most effective in treating the disorder given that person's identity. Well, if you're still confused, keep in mind that we've done this already with depression. Uh, so my lecture on depression in men is, is pretty much what I'm looking for. Uh, that is to say, I talked about how the symptoms maybe look different for men than they look different for women. I talked about some ways in which men might uh, get depressed that are different than ways in which women might get depressed. Um, and I may or may not have talked about the treatment aspect, but one aspect that I want you to talk about is thinking about um, how that particular identity might need some different types of treatment or might need a different arrangement of treatment or might have a preferential uh, treatment. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you're working with men in depression, right, they, they tend to like something that is maybe less emotional to start out with, right? So maybe just the facts, um, how long have you been depressed? What is it like uh, when you're feeling that way? When are some times that you don't feel that way? Uh, versus, you know, that sounds really terrible. Uh, how often are you crying? Can you tell me some of the stuff uh, that makes you really upset, right? Some of those questions are maybe gonna 
and I'm really stereotyping here, but I'm just trying to give you a sense uh, of the fact that you might need to think about that in uh, a different way than you would if you were working uh, with a client who's a woman and, and, and for whom most of our literature, especially on depression, uh, is kind of geared towards. So what types of things might you need to be uh, doing differently? Some of this stuff is gonna be things um, that most of these things, I should say, are gonna be things that you can research. Uh, some of these might be just ideas you have. I would like for you to earmark those uh, as an idea, right? This is something that I've thought about um, I know when I was in graduate school, for instance, uh, one of the things that I thought about, I actually haven't done this in my practice yet, is uh, that men actually communicate better when they're doing something uh, together. So I had this idea of doing walking therapy, uh, where you go on a walk, you know, just a, a little hike or a little trail or something, uh, where you're doing the therapy in that motion, right? So you can make some stuff up or you can have some ideas, but uh, I also wanna at least see those things be connected to some research, why do you think that idea would work even if it's not out there yet? Uh, or maybe you're just pulling from something that you know, hey, here's a type of therapy therapy uh, that works really well for, um, uh, here's a type of therapy that works really well for lesbian couples that doesn't necessarily uh, work so good for heterosexual couples, uh, that type of thing. So again, you're gonna pick a disorder, axis one disorder, not depression. You're going to pick one of those uh, a disorder it can be something we've talked about already uh, it can be something that you see ahead or something that you just know is a, is a disorder i do want it to be a dsm uh, disorder uh, and then you're going to pick an identity you're going to pick an identity that you belong to i don't really want folks um, at this point in your career talking about the other um, there's enough work for you to do uh, with yourself that that you don't need to be thinking about, well, this is how women should deal with depression, or this is how um, this is how white folks should handle their anxiety, right? That doesn't have a good tone uh, to it. So instead, I want you to be thinking about what's some aspect of your own identity. That doesn't necessarily mean, of course, that you have to be struggling with a disorder or anything like that, but if you're uh, a woman, if you're a man, and you're wanting to pick sex, well, it's been decided for you. Uh, if you're wanting to pick race, pick your own race. If you're wanting to pick sexual orientation, um, pick your own sexual orientation. These, these types of things. I know that I mentioned age. Um, you can pick it. I've seen folks pick it. I think it's best used if you're thinking about college age because that is sort of a cultural identity for a moment at least. Um, but I, I, would, I would challenge you to have that be your last resort. I don't think that's as interesting is thinking about what I'm really asking you to do when I'm thinking about culture is really thinking about uh, those things that are unique uh, about individuals. Everybody, um, if they get it, if the opportunity to, gets to be a young person. Everybody, if they get the opportunity, gets to be an old person. So uh, that's not really any type of specific culture in my book. It's a transient uh, culture of anything. I'm really thinking about, you know, is there something that if you're a Jewish person that you really got to think about if you're dealing with uh, some type of dissociative disorder, some uh, type of anxiety disorder that's, that's different, that has different symptoms, that needs a different treatment. So I want you doing that work. This is important because uh, if you're ever a clinician, you have to consider those things. You have to understand where the client's coming from, uh, not just in terms of what they're necessarily bringing to the table themselves, but also sometimes just the community that you expect that they're coming out of, right? What are the pressures on them that might be different? What are um, the expectations on them that might be different? Um, uh, what are the relationships uh, that person might have that might be different than my own uh, type of relationships? So I really want you thinking about those cultural pieces um, and using that to identify some ways in which, again, the disorder might show up, the disorder might manifest, or the disorder and uh, how the disorder might be treated. So thinking about those two things, uh, sometimes what folks do is they do a first section where they're just describing the disorder kind of openly, and then maybe a second section where they're describing it with regard uh, to these folks. That's fine. If I'm being honest, I usually skim the first part because you're just telling me uh, what the disorder is that I, I probably taught you. Um, 
And uh, I usually just kind of read that second part. I think better papers are the ones that incorporate telling me about the disorder and then telling me how it's different, or maybe just telling me how it's different, assuming that I know about the disorder uh, already. So uh, the page limit, uh, I believe is five to seven. Don't quote me on that, go by whatever it says um, in your syllabus and online, uh, but I believe it's five to seven, maybe four to six, one of those. Uh, so look for that in terms of length and, uh, uh, and content. Um, I believe it says you need three references. Um, you can use your book once, uh, basically, but you're gonna need a couple others. Uh, you, I imagine, or I would at least say that the best papers I've seen usually have more than that. Uh, so, you know, knock yourself out. All right, that's enough about the paper. If, if uh, you have questions, uh, you know, send me an email. I, I know you know by now that I'm bad at email, but uh, I do get to them when I, when I get a chance and so I will respond to you, it just might take a little while, uh, but if you have questions about that, go ahead uh, and email me and I'll get to you by the end of the week um, for sure. Okay, uh, so let's jump into this stuff here and uh, looking at these different disorders. So when we're talking about trauma, one of the things I opened up with in this class was thinking about the fact that most of our diagnoses are kind of a top-down diagnosis. That is to say, we sort of name it and then we name what the symptoms might be under it and we don't really think about causes related to the, the diagnostic or related to um, uh, the diagnosing at all. It's maybe this usually happens, but it's not a piece of the picture generally. Uh, when we get to trauma disorders, here's something where that is actually not the case, where we actually do see that there's more of, at least, a bottom-up way of thinking about how these disorders show up, how they manifest, than with some of the disorders that we've already looked at, um, depression and then certainly uh, a couple of the other anxiety categories. But here we have in post-traumatic stress disorder, and the same will also be true for acute stress disorder, um, the idea that this disorder, what holds it together isn't necessarily its set of symptoms, what holds it together is the, the trauma that occurs that makes those set of symptoms show up. Because of that, the list of diagnostic criteria in the DSM for post-traumatic stress disorder is one, two, three and a half pages long. Now, I don't think this should necessarily be a problem, but it does highlight uh, what I was talking about when I was talking about this idea of bottom-up diagnosing, which is to say, if we think about the fact that certain things in a human's life experience can have certain effects, in this case, trauma causing, well, what we're calling PTSD, uh, what that is gonna look like is we're gonna have to really open up the, the symptom list in order to accommodate the various ways in which a person may experience, in this case, trauma or the reaction they may have to that trauma. Uh, and that's what you see here. That's what this long list is. I will go through some of it. Uh, but the idea is basically that, well, you might get depression symptoms, you might get anxiety symptoms, you might get uh, dissociative symptoms, you might get really angry, you might have a hard time uh, sleeping, you might have a startle, right? All of these different things that might show up um, that are basically the result of this experience of trauma. Uh, we talked about how in depression they could really think about that as kind of a post-loss disorder, if you will. It doesn't have the same ring as depression, but uh, that idea of losing something could result in X, Y, and Z. For um, my money, that really helps us fill in those gaps in terms of that masculine depression that I um, went on and on about. Uh, that is to say, if you say that loss causes, it's a lot easier to say, hey, we can also just throw anger in that list. We can also throw in risk taking uh, in that list rather than thinking about, well, uh, from that top-down process, I don't know, it only looks like, you know, 5-10% of folks get this risk-taking thing. Well, if only, you know, 10% of your clients are men in the first place, that's half the men, uh, that, that might be worth putting in, but we can't see it that way, and so we leave it out. 
Uh, but when you do something from this bottom up process, you really get this opportunity to begin to say, listen, everybody might not do that, but we shouldn't be surprised if somebody shows up and they've experienced a death in their family and they're angry um, and they can't stop working instead of they're sad and they don't want to go to work, right? Uh, that allows us to have that understanding that that's still depression. That's still because they lost something, someone in this case, uh, important to them. All right. So let's look at this, sorry, dissociative post-traumatic stress disorder uh, in particular. Um, the thing that's gonna set this up, of course, is the fact that somebody has experienced some type of trauma and that they're having some uh, psychogenic reaction to this trauma. That's important to understand because we're not talking about here a somatogenic uh, response. It is to say, this is not a traumatic brain injury. This isn't that you got hit in the head and yes, it was, it was frightening and traumatic, but really the issue in terms of your psychology is the fact that um, you know you got knocked in the head and you have this concussion now and you're having some symptoms related to that physical damage. No, we're talking clearly here and specifically about the psychological effects of that trauma. That is to say, you just saw or heard about, um, experienced something, etc., but there wasn't any physical injury to your brain that's resulting in the thing that we're working on uh, today, that we're working on uh, in terms of seeing a psychologist. So um, what's important about that is to understand that trauma is a specific set of things. Uh, one of my little pet peeves as a psychologist uh, is how often I hear the word trauma used or traumatized uh, used when people just mean you know, frustrated or irritated or uh, maybe even upset or pissed off, but uh, they certainly don't mean traumatized. Um, and I don't mind just kind of language, you know, you can say whatever you want, but often I think what's happening is we start to actually think that those things are traumatized. We start to think that just because somebody um, is triggered or uncomfortable or offended or irritated or pissed off, right, that that counts as trauma. And so we should treat those interactions as if the person is being traumatized by being exposed to X, Y, or Z. And I think we need to have a real clear boundary between that's not trauma, that's just challenging you, or that's just pushing your boundaries, or that's just pissing you off. I mean, you can still be offended and, and upset, but understand that that's not trauma, right? Because trauma has this real psychological weight to it that if we water it down with, you just, you know, interacted with somebody who's, you know, making an offensive comment to you that you've been traumatized. Well, now we can't really find the trauma that we're looking for. Now we can't really identify those things. And there's also this reverse effect where if you tell a person they've been traumatized, they are more likely to feel traumatized. Um, if you tell a person uh, that this thing that happens to them that they felt maybe bad about, maybe neutral about, if you tell them that was trauma, you were traumatized when your dad spanked you when you were 10 for stealing from the store. That, that was traumatizing, right? The person is more likely to reflect on that as trauma. And in some cases, we even see in, engage in some of these um, manifestations as if they had been traumatized. Generally, you're not going to get somebody to PTSD by telling them uh, that they were traumatized, but you might start to see them have uh, some sort of anxiety or depression uh, around those things uh, just because, oh no, I, I hear this is terrible. Um, and so because of that, I think we have to be careful about calling our own experiences trauma when they're not, not to say when it is, you shouldn't call it that. And then also when somebody else is having an experience, it's maybe difficult or challenging for them that we don't go so far as to say that they've been traumatized. The real reaction, if you want to be helpful to them, uh, is to help them process it or help them uh, through it, not in a clinical way, but just as a friend. Like, man, that was really scary when, um, I don't know, you, you lost your balance on, on your bike on the trail today, like, are you okay? You know, just be there versus, dude, that was traumatic. Oh my God, I can't believe you. You know, <laughs> that that gives the wrong message. And again, that person may go, yeah, that was traumatic. This really, I don't know if I should ride bikes anymore, man. That's right. That's the type of thing that can happen when you start miscategorizing uh, folks' experiences and making them sound worse than they are. So what is trauma then? Okay, the DSM is helpful here. It gives us a list of four things that we consider to be trauma. 
Uh, this list has expanded over the years, in particular to include um, sexual trauma. Um, again, thinking about PTSD, where it, come, where it came from, it really was uh, kind of evolved out of this idea of shell shock. So the first folks uh, that we think about when we think about PTSD, unlike other disorders, by the way, uh, tends to be soldiers. So here's a disorder that actually does have some norm basis uh, on men because men tend to be soldiers, and this is how we've conceptualized this disorder. Um, and if you ask some feminists, they will tell you that this disorder actually has the problem that I'm talking about with depression and some other disorders in the other, in the other direction, uh, in that certainly previously it didn't include the effects and the types of trauma that women may experience um, and really focused on the types of trauma uh, that men experience, which is to say war and, and accidents and this type of thing. Uh, more usually versus uh, sexual or uh, sometimes other types of abusive uh, relational trauma that women are more likely to experience. And so because of that, right, you get women who often have PTSD still to this day, um, it's going to have this imbalance who don't necessarily get the treatment or don't necessarily get the response that they need because maybe we're just going to call it depression or maybe we're just going to call it this other type of anxiety because you're not having this angry uh, reaction to the fireworks. You're, you're just crying. That looks more like depression. Uh, grandpa over here punched a hole in the wall last time we set fire. You know, so if you have this kind of mindset of who it's supposed to be versus who it actually is, uh, it's important to, to build in some of these things. So um, the DSM-5 does a pretty good job of, of, of uh, rolling that back a bit and, and being more inclusive of the types of trauma uh, that women experience. Um, but uh, there's more research to do, uh, I would say, and so there are probably some things here that if we get a DSM-6 or 5.5 um, will be changed around a bit. All right, so here's trauma. Uh, the following criteria apply to adults, adolescents, and children older than six years. For children six years and younger, see corresponding criteria below. Uh, so some of what I showed you in this three and a half pages uh, was a set of criteria for children. Uh, not that it's even at a page and a half, this is the longest diagnostic criteria. Um, all right, so A, and here's where they're defining trauma. So it says exposure to actual threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. This is their definition of trauma. Exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, sexual violence in one of the following ways. That's what we consider trauma. Uh, so you can see that it's actually a pretty narrow list of things. Uh, so your roommate <laughs> um, playing music at 4 a.m. is not trauma. Number one, directly experiencing the traumatic event. So uh, this is just saying, right, you see someone die, you see someone get seriously injured uh, in front of you or uh, someone threatens, threatens to kill you directly, right? So directly experiencing the traumatic event. Number two, witnessing in person the events as they occurred to others. So you see somebody else get killed, or you see somebody else get mutilated, um, or uh, you see somebody else have their life threatened in a way that is uh, serious, right? Not just, I'll kill you, but like, you can see that they are likely or potentially going to die in a situation, right? Also can be traumatizing. Number three, so directly experiencing one, witnessing uh, two, three, learning that the traumatic event occurred to a close family member or to a close friend. Uh, in cases of actual or threatened death of a family member, the events must have been violent or accidental. So it can also be traumatizing to learn uh, that somebody really close to you, now this isn't just any old body, this generally isn't gonna be somebody, you know, a celebrity that you see on the news or something like that, unless you, you know, had a really close relationship. And then I would probably say, uh, when I say relationship, I mean you really admire the person, and that's probably still just mourning uh, in most cases. Um, but if you hear that your parent or that your sibling or your spouse or your child certainly, right, had died in a way that was 
sudden, that is to say unexpected. Um, you know, they had an illness that you didn't know about, or they were in a car crash, or, you know, they got pulled under. I don't want to keep naming terrible things, but right, that, that it was something that you didn't expect to happen, or it was relatively violent, right? There was um, a murder, or there was some, you know, really graphic accident or something like that uh, that happened, right? Those are the two ways in which hearing about something might also induce trauma. So we wouldn't consider it traumatic if you just found out um, that somebody close to you died in a relatively normal way. They died of old age or um, they've been sick for a long time and you know you knew it was coming, that type of thing. That we, we wouldn't consider trauma. Uh, but again, if it's something quick, unexpected or really violent, um, even just hearing about it, right? Because often you're gonna picture that in your head. You're gonna be really curious about it, which may make you picture it more. Um, and that type of rumination can really begin to creep up in your brain. And now it's all you're thinking about. And now you're afraid to see it on TV. Some folks seeking it out uh, to watch on TV, maybe you know, trying to relive it. You get all of these different uh, reactions, <clears throat> even just uh, to hearing about it, about somebody that you knew well, and about hearing that it was kind of a devastating death. And then number four is extreme repeated sorry, experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to the aversive details of the traumatic events. Um, and so the examples they give here are first responders, um, right, who are often coming in, or police officers, right, who are often coming in and, uh, you know, cleaning up some, some terrible accident or cleaning up some a terrible crime, right? And they have to do this day after day. Uh, and a part of it is not traumatizing, right? Because they didn't see it happen. It's usually not somebody close to them, right? But what they're telling us here is that that repeated exposure to something, even that is, even to something that is somewhat impersonal to you, uh, can begin to creep in and become traumatizing. One thing that I will say um, that I find interesting, and I've seen some writing on this is uh, talking to other black folks about police br these police brutality videos. Um, I know for me that it is jarring and I at this point have really tried to stop watching them um, because there is something that happens in the fact that you keep seeing these once a month, couple times a month, every other month, whatever it is, these sort of brutal videos of uh, folks dying, folks being killed, I imagine, and I, and I believe I've seen some soft research, that is to say an article quoting uh, research uh, that talks about the fact that that is potentially traumatizing, especially to black folks who are maybe seeing some part of themselves in that incident. But even if not, even if you don't identify with a person due to their race, but maybe you are just traumatized by the fact that you are witnessing somebody being killed um, over and over again, whether that be they're replaying the same video uh, or whether that be, well, here's another one that you can see and here's another one uh, that you can see. And so here for me, um, you know, I'm not ready to call it necessarily uh, true trauma, but I, I would suggest that there is uh, some research there and there's certainly the potential, if not, it's already there, uh, certainly the potential uh, for that type of thing to be traumatizing and cause these type of reactions that we're gonna see below. So directly experiencing it yourself, witnessing it right in front of you, learning about it, if it's somebody uh, that is close to you and, and they were, something happened to them that was violent or accidental, um, and then the, the repeated experiencing of it, even if it's not uh, personal, even if it's not somebody you know, but you just keep seeing these same images and you keep having to deal with these same um, kind of terrible um, in, in incidences. So again, threatened death, actual uh, death, serious injury or sexual violence, those are the areas of trauma. So that was all A, so here we are at B, B. The presence of one or more of the following intrusion symptoms associated with the traumatic event 
beginning after the traumatic event has occurred. So intrusion basically means you have a thought that comes in that you didn't want it to come in. Uh, everybody has intrusive thoughts. Um, that is to say, sometimes you just didn't want to be thinking about uh, that movie that made you sad, or sometimes that song that you're trying to get out of your head uh, popped out, or sometimes, you know, the classic examples, you have a dirty thought in church, uh, these type of things. Everybody has intrusive thoughts, um, but here the intrusive thought is, of course, going to be about the trauma. And because that trauma is, well, traumatic, the fact that that thought just blossoms in your head is a little bit different than just having a song pop up in your head that you didn't want to. So the jarring nature of that thought is, is a piece of why this is a symptom uh, and why it's you know, important to know and point out. So it says, the presence of one or more of the following intrusive, intrusive symptoms associated with the traumatic event beginning after the traumatic event occurred. Number one, recurrent involuntary and intrusive, distressing memories of the traumatic event. So again, the event just comes up, comes into your head, it recurs, you don't want it to, and probably it's, it's traumatic to you, not traumatic, but probably um, it's at least anxiety provoking to you at the time. Number two, recurrent distressing dreams in which the content and or affect, affect just means emotion here, in which the content and or emotion of the dream are related to the traumatic event. So you're dreaming about the event. This is usually going to be a nightmare, um, more so than you would call it just a dream. Number three, dissociative symptoms. That is flashbacks or such as flashbacks in which the individual feels or acts as if the traumatic event were recurring. Such reactions may occur on a continuum with the most extreme expressing being a complete loss of awareness uh, or their present surroundings. So um, here we're talking about flashbacks and this is probably something that you've at least seen um, demonstrated or caricatured uh, on television where you know this is kind of the, the trope example of grandpa and the fireworks, right? The, those fireworks make him think that he's actually back in Vietnam or wherever. Um, and so they start to react to the environment uh, as if they're there currently, right? So uh, that's one level of the flashback. Another flashback may really look more like an intrusive memory, um, that is to say, or an intrusive thought, that is to say, you're basically just remembering something traumatic that happened to you because, in this case, the fireworks reminded you of that, but you're not necessarily living it. You're just kind of like, oh no, I remember when that happened, right? And you kind of think through, or maybe you visualize the story in your head, but again, not the same as sort of uh, interacting in the environment in that way. So they're saying that that type of flashback can exist on a continuum where one is sort of an intrusive thought, and then the other is really, um, is really this more reliving of the event. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Number four, intense or prolonged psychological distress at exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. Uh, so the person gets distressed when they have something that reminds them of it, whether that be in the fireworks or maybe a war movie or commercial comes on, uh, that type of thing. They see old buddy, you know, buddy calls it, uh, from, uh, from their time in the service. Uh, that type of thing and they just get really upset or they definitely don't want to watch that or turn that shit off right this type of thing um this isn't of course going so far as a flashback or an intrusive thought even but it is kind of evoking a feeling generally anxiety or fear uh, sometimes masked by anger um, that's going to come up as a result of them kind of seeing or interacting and, and sometimes it's just thinking about as they say maybe internally uh, they just have that intrusive thought, or maybe they start thinking about something innocuously. Oh, wh wh whatever happened in old, old Tom back from um, my days uh, overseas, you know, and you start thinking about Tom and you start thinking about, oh no, remember when we were in that firefight, right? And then you get pissed off or you get upset or something. And so um, any of those type of things that bring that emotional piece up in addition to those cognitive uh, thoughts or uh, that even full sort of uh, in vivo flashback 
that's going to be symptomatic. Number five, marked physiological reactions to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of a traumatic event. So this is the same one, uh, except instead of an emotional reaction, you're going to have a physiological reaction, right? We talked about that in the first couple of days of class. Um, that kind of conversion, as Freud would have called it, or somatization as we tend to call it these days, where you experience that, that psychological stress, you experience it in your body. Uh, so you start getting headaches or muscle aches or this type of thing. So um, you turn the movie on, uh, the war movie Saving Private Ryan, it reminds your grandpa uh, of his time over in uh, some, uh, some war or some conflict that he was in uh, and so he doesn't yell at you to turn it off you don't see him get upset uh, but suddenly you see that he's getting really tense and you know his neck's starting to hurt or this type of thing right that's that same thing he's just having a physiological response here instead of excuse me instead of a psychological cognitive or emotional one number C persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the traumatic event beginning after the traumatic event occurred, as evidenced by one or more of the following. Number one, avoidance of or efforts to avoid distressing memories, thoughts, feelings about, or closely associated with the traumatic event. Number two, avoidance of or efforts to avoid external reminders, people, places, conversations, activities, objects, situations that arouse distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about or closely associated with the traumatic events. D, negative alterations in cognition and mood associated with traumatic events, beginning or worsening after the traumatic event occurred. Uh, I'm not gonna read through those, there are seven of them, uh, but that's on page 271. I'm just going to read kind of the highlight and then there are several that go under some of these but just to save us some time and then number e marked art alterations in arousal or reactivity associated with the traumatic event beginning or worsening after the traumatic event occurred uh, so that previous one was really just talking about um sort of having a negative mood uh overall um you might call this depression you might begin to call these symptoms of depression. So the person's mood just overall changes after the traumatic event. They kind of become a different person. Uh, and you often see folks say this about people who are maybe coming home from war or certainly somebody who's had some type of traumatic event, some type of sexual violence or something like that, right? The, this person, they seem like a totally different person uh, after it. Sometimes they don't even know that the trauma occurred, right? They just see this shift and usually the person's a little darker, a little angrier, a little sadder, something like that, more anxious. Uh, and so you see this broad shift in the person. Um, and so that's what this is talking about, negative alterations in cognition and mood associated with the traumatic event. So you just see that start to happen. Um, and then this is the same thing, there's sort of mark, uh, marked alterations in arousal and reactivity. Here they're just talking about the same, it's a different uh, change in mood, but here they're accounting for the fact that it may go in this more frantic direction, right? This person uh, becomes a little bit OCD in the sense of like they need to have things be checked out just to make sure they're safe. They need to be really vigilant. They're overactive. They sort of tap their feet and move their hands a lot when they're just having to stand still, right? Uh, this type of uh, alteration in mood uh, can also be seen in addition to sometimes or instead of uh, that kind of more negative mood uh, sometimes you will see uh, also this person can be this more frantic hyper vigilant person who's really just kind of worried uh, all the time um and then so it, it goes on from there uh, the other things that you might include are more things like dissociation uh, so this is kind of like daydreaming the person uh, drifts off or depersonalization where the person doesn't feel like they're in their own body or they don't feel like they're in the real world. Um, all of these things, uh, all of these varied symptoms can be a reaction to uh, trauma. So uh, one of the things that you should know, and I have to look for it,
One of the things uh, that you should know about PTSD is that the symptoms need to last for a month or more. So if you remember with depression, it was two weeks. Uh, here with uh, PTSD, it's actually a month. So this person needs to persist with these symptoms for a whole month before we're gonna be ready to give a, a full PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. Uh, but we do have this other diagnosis here uh, that is acute stress disorder. And this is gonna be for less than a month. And sometimes you'll get folks who have this kind of trauma reaction, uh, but it eventually subsides. And this is what we call the acute stress disorder. So you get somebody who's maybe in a bad car accident or something, um, and you know it doesn't matter really if the person was hurt or not, it really is more about how it hits them in the head. But let's say that they didn't get hurt too bad. Uh, maybe they you know, broke their ankle or something, something that um, you know, affected them, but it wasn't, nobody died or anything like that. So still violent injury, uh, still, you know, kind of really scary, really jarring, it's happening to you directly. So we're, we're on the mark for trauma. Uh, but what we find in some of these cases is that they get these traumatic symptoms where, you know, they're afraid to get in a car, all they're thinking about is the wreck, they're, they're daydreaming, they're night dreaming, nightmaring about the wreck. Uh, and they'll do this for a while. And then eventually they seem to get through it or they seem to just go back to normal and maybe they maintain some of their fears, right? Maybe they're a little careful uh, in the car, or maybe they don't like driving down a certain road at night, whatever it is, but you overall kind of see them go back to themselves, right? They pull themselves out of that trauma relatively quickly. It's like they have that thing, they have a couple weeks where they're kind of out of sorts and it freaks them out, but then you see about a month later, okay, you know, that happened to me, I'm okay now. I'm back to normal. I don't want to repeat it, but I'm not having nightmares about it anymore. I'm not having intrusive thoughts. And again, this is the acute stress disorder. Uh, if you look it up, when you look it up in the, in the DSM or in your textbook, you will see that it's almost exactly the same set of symptoms, the exact same set of criteria. The only difference is just this time span. That is to say how long the person has it. So you might see somebody uh, that comes in right after a trauma, diagnose them with this, and then see that it's not going away and, and diagnose them with this. That's not great practice. Um, this probably should only be given perfectly uh, after you've seen that it truly was acute, right? After you've seen uh, that it did end before a month. So it's the type of thing that you might just say, trauma disorder unspecified, uh, and then once the month was over and you saw, hey, this person pulled themselves out of that, that's an acute stress disorder. Because otherwise, you're waiting to see if after a month, you should change it to this. And then at that time, if they've still got all those symptoms, then you would give that PTSD diagnosis uh, rather than having a diagnosis that you have to scratch off and say, no, it actually was this. You give that placeholder diagnosis and say, this is a placeholder. We're gonna try to get something more substantial in here, but it's something about trauma. And then later realizing, okay, it's lasted two months, five months. Uh, it's PTSD, it can't be acute. Okay, um, let's keep looking at uh, some of these other disorders here. So this next set of disorders, these next two uh, are really fascinating. And I did give you a video uh, on reactive attachment disorder. I can't ever find any good socially, uh, social disinhibited, uh, disinhibited engagement disorder videos. Whenever I search for it, I just get reactive attachment videos. If you find something uh, and you want to email that to me, uh, I'd love to see it because I usually have a really hard time uh, finding anything that uh, demonstrates this. But both of these are disorders that are primarily going to be diagnosed uh, in children. Actually, I think they are exclusively uh, diagnosable in children. And what happens here is these are two kind of attachment styles uh, that you don't usually hear about when you're learning about attachment generally. So usually when you're thinking about attachment, right, you've got the secure attachment and then you've got the insecure. And then under this, you've got anxious 
and, and, and build it. Right? And then you've got these are basically the three attachment styles. Well, these are still attachments. These are still uh, attachments. I, I like to tell my students when I'm teaching this, and I like to tell you guys now, that if you've learned about these and you were like, oh no, insecure attachment, really bad, it's still an attachment. If you watch the kids in the video or you learn about these attachment styles, they still love their mom. They still want to be with her. They just might be like, you know, I uh, guess she's leaving again, or please don't leave, right? And so these two types uh, of attachments are still attachments. These kids are, uh, in this case, still attached, and they can still form relationships. They're just going to have some, uh, some more difficulties in terms of certain things uh, that we would expect from this person, this kid. There are other attachments, uh, and here's one of them, a reactive attachment. This is no attachment, or closer to. The reactive attachment disorder seems to come about from a kid in particular who prior to the age of two, two years old, did not get the love and attention that most kids, it's tough to say this, but I think it makes sense, expect to get, right? That you come into this world and if you believe young, we've got a certain set of unconscious um, collections or collective unconscious uh, that says, well, this is what it means to be human and I'm going to be born and there's going to be this woman and she's going to love me. There's going to be this other guy. He's going to love me too. They're going to make sure nobody hurts me. Uh, they're going to make sure I get fed, right? There's this, this way in which kids kind of know that that's what's supposed to happen to them. Uh, and not really, but, the, but they're set up for it to happen to them. And when those things don't happen, you, what you see is that the psychology of the kid begins to shift to account for, oh, nobody's gonna help me, nobody's loving me, I'm not getting fed as soon as I should get fed, right? That, that I'm gonna probably have to do a lot of these things myself that coming into the world, I thought on a level, were, I was gonna be able to share in. So I've gotta retool my thinking into how I'm gonna get my needs met given the fact that mom's, you know, smoking crack and dad's, um, you know, beating her when he's home, right? And so these type of things uh, are what's likely to result in a reactive attachment disorder. These kids almost, um, as a rule, will have a childhood where it was either extremely abusive or extremely neglectful. Uh, you rarely get a kid who's in a okay, even good enough household that would show up with this disorder or this one, but we'll talk about it in a second. So the reactive attachment disorder, if you didn't watch already, I really, really encourage you to go watch the video of the little girl uh, that's in this playlist. Um, she's somebody who's been diagnosed with a reactive attachment disorder. There's a long and varied story about her um, that's, that I think has a positive ending and then a negative one. So uh, maybe check that out if you're curious. Um, I think her, anyway, check it out if you're curious. But basically these folks learn, these children learn, that nobody's gonna help me. And because of that, they stop attaching, especially to adults. They stop trusting adults, they stop believing adults, uh, they stop believing what adults say, they stop thinking that an adult will eventually, or at some point, fix the problem, or that the adult has their best interest in mind. And they may think this about everyone, either, uh, even other children. And so because of this, what you see is that these kids don't respond to social cues, social interaction, social motivations, interpersonal, um, even love, affection in the same way that other children do at this age. Uh, this kid wants something and you try to talk them out of it or you try to give them a reason or you even threaten to punish or we'll get it next time, or we have one at home, right? These things aren't gonna usually work on this kid. This kid doesn't trust adults, he doesn't believe what you say, he wants what he wants, and you're not giving it to him. And, I, and sometimes this works. Sometimes if I throw a temper tantrum, and I freak out, and I won't stop, and I won't stop, I can get what I want. Sometimes that'll work, right? I'm already not gonna get it if I just sit here, so 
I might as well give him give a shot, right? And so you'll get these kids who will go through these really extravagant, um, sometimes violent, if you if you look at the little girl uh, in the video, um, actions in, in order to get the things that they want. And you'll see that they tend to have this really cool disregard for others. Sometimes it's that they hate them, uh, often that sometimes directed more towards adults, uh, but other times they just don't care. Like they, they just don't care. I don't care that you're telling me that I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't do this. I don't care if you're telling me that if I'm a good boy, I, I can have these other things. I don't care what you're saying. I want that, and so I'm gonna freak out until I get that. Um, and so again, really hard to form relationships, really hard to discipline, um, really hard to get them to accept uh, your love and affection, right? Uh, they may do it in a calculated way in some cases, but they're not necessarily going to enjoy it or seek it out the way that you would expect to, you know, if it, if it were just a regular kid, that they would. That sometimes they're going to want to come cuddle on the couch and watch a movie with you and crawl on your bed, you know, and get between you and mom or you and dad, right? That, that normal kids sort of seek these, uh, these moments out. Uh, these kids won't. Uh, these kids will. Um, I can do it my own, nobody's going to help me, and that's kind of how they uh, approach life. What we know about this particular attachment style is that it can often result in two personality disorders, and I know we haven't gotten here quite yet, but what you should know is that these personality disorders tend to be endemic, that this is who the person is. There isn't a way to really cure it. We can, tr we can treat it. We can help the person see it and make some choices different, but uh, they're always going to want to make the choices that, that, that they're making. And so these are actually two of the most severe personality disorders, which is to say an antisocial personality disorder and a borderline uh, personality disorder. Uh, folks with a reactive attachment disorder we have found uh, are more likely than uh, other folks to, to, to turn into one of these personality types. Antisocial, again, we aren't here yet, but these are folks who don't have any empathy. These are folks who um, we sometimes call them sociopaths and psychopaths. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to kill anybody, but they have the capacity because they don't feel empathy to do it with a little bit more ease. Uh, than the rest of us. Um, and so that's the antisocial person. You can see how not getting this attachment, right? Not figuring out that people are here to love you and help you and connect with you. And most of them are gonna be neutral, if not kind to you, right? If you don't ever get this message, especially when you're a child, this makes you kind of take this and it's in the name, antisocial. Okay, well, society's against me then. I'm against society. And so you kind of take this uh, tact where you're just going to do whatever it takes for you to survive and screw everybody else. I know I gender things a lot in here, but I think it's helpful. Um, this is a more masculine display of this, uh, this evolution, right? I'm going to take what I want, screw your feelings, I'll kill you if I have to, right? This is a more masculine uh, demonstration of this. That's not going to necessarily um, be as easy for a woman to pull off, uh, right? Well, folks are going to have a feeling, more feelings about a woman who's cold and um, um, and, and hurtful in, a, in an aggressive, violent way uh, than they are about a man. They're going to have feelings about him too, but it's a little more in the gender role, right? So for here with uh, women or more of a feminine display of this, uh, this reactive attachment development is gonna be the borderline personality. Um, and these folks form relationships, but they form really anxious relationships. Not here, but like, where are you going? All of the time. Why didn't you call? You looked at her, you must love her, I'm gonna slash your tires. Why, you know? So you can't ever see her again. And if you really loved me, you would come out here and slash them with me, right? And so uh, these folks tend to be more manipulative. The, the, the crux of the relationship is that they're so insecure about relationships, they're so insecure about attachments that they see so many things as being a threat to that attachment. 
that they will go to these really extreme ends, sometimes looking like the antisocial sociopath, um, to keep that person in the relationship. I'll kill myself if you try to leave, right? Whoa, whoa. I will, right? And they, and they will. I mean, not necessarily kill themselves, but they will slash their wrist uh, in, some, in some cases. And so you get this person, right, in the, in the case of the borderline, you get this person who um, gets relationships in a way they, they at least want them, which is different than the antisocial personality, but they're so worried that this one's going to get away because they haven't had many, and this one seems so great. The other thing they'll do is they'll idealize that person. This person's amazing, they're so great, it's the best person I've ever met, right, and then they do something they don't like, and then it's like, you know, then they want to slash your tires and you're an idiot and, you know, this type of thing. So they have this kind of back and forth. We'll talk uh, more about that when we get to personality disorders. But really, I just want you to know that there's something really important for humans about those first couple of years of your life, getting that love, getting that attention. If you've taken my Gen Psych class or someone else's, uh, this is basically Freud's oral stage of development, right? And if you know about that oral stage of development, it's about getting your needs met. The uh, analogy there being, are you being fed? Are you crying a lot? Are you sticking poison in your mouth, right? Or, or is somebody feeding you and uh, stopping you from crying and stopping you from putting poison in your mouth? Uh, but if not, right, you start to figure out, okay, stuff's dangerous and nobody's helpful. Uh, and so you start to really turn inward, you start to turn to your own devices, uh, or in some cases you figure out, okay, I guess relationships are important, but they're tricky to get and you better hold on really, really tight or you're gonna be alone again and, and you don't wanna be eating poison. Um, the social disinhibited engagement, I think I've written this wrong, social, all right, <laughs> I mean, if you wrote that down, sorry. Have a little dyslexic moment. It's disinhibited social engagement disorder. All right, so flip those two words. Um, this is interesting because it actually seems to come from the same same setup as, as the reactive attachment disorder. That is to say, it seems to come from a kid who's been severely abused or neglected, and yet they, these kids take the opposite tactic somehow and, and i often wonder i don't know but i often wonder if maybe this kid got a little bit of love and attention like he got to see it but then it, it went away uh whereas maybe this kid you know just really never showed up because these kids rather than completely turning away from social relationships what you'll see is they kind of over they they overdo it um but they overdo it in a weird way they want relationships, but they don't ever really seem to form, at least while the disorder is ongoing, specific attachments. What's that mean? That means, let's say I get a foster kid and, you know, because of the circumstances of uh, his or her uh, upbringing, their childhood, they have this disinhibited social engagement disorder. And, um, you know, for a couple, let's say they're with me for a couple months and we, I see they're really getting along and they're really hanging out and, you know, we're having fun together. It seems like we're making a good fit. And then one day we go to the zoo in Kansas City. Uh, we're sitting uh, on a bench and I say, hey, you know, buddy, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get us some snow cones uh, or something. I walk over, I get snow cones. Uh, I turn around and there is the kid that I've that I'm foster caring, uh, walking off into the distance with some strange person. These kids are not, <laughs> it's in the name, they're not inhibited in their social engagements. They'll basically walk off with anybody. They'll basically be best friends with anybody. If somebody says, hey kid, um, do you wanna come with me and get in my van and go live in Kentucky? Okay, right, this is the kid who doesn't really seem to have that filter. And in fact, some of these kids not only uh, could be persuaded easily in that way, some of these kids would seek that out, right? So maybe the stranger didn't come up and ask the kid to go away with them. Maybe the stranger came and sat down 
And the kid sat in his lap and put his arm around him and acted like, oh, this is my dad or this is my uncle. And maybe the guy thought the kid was lost and said, yeah, are you okay? Do you want to come with me? We can go find your dad. Kid will say, okay. Right? They, they don't have this sense of boundaries. They don't have this sense of danger. They don't have this sense, right? So whereas this kid sort of used his terrible experience as a child to figure out, hey, people are really dangerous. Nobody's going to be helpful to me. This kid decided it, it's a dangerous world, I guess, but I really need somebody. I got to find somebody to, to go with, right? You'll do. And they'll just go with you. Oh, oh, you're the new one. Okay, you'll do now, right? And so they really don't have this sense of attaching in a way that's like, no, you're not my dad. My dad's over there. I'm not going to go with you, who I just met, when this guy that I've been living with for all my life or a few months, if it's a foster kid, right? They don't have that sense of preference. They really just will go with anybody. Uh, they don't have this uh, inhibition in their social engagement. So um, I don't know as much about how this might develop. I can imagine some of these kids actually becoming borderline. It's, it's that same sort of uh, maybe learning to, that they really want to hold on to a relationship. I don't know, maybe that's the opposite. I'm really guessing what you hear. Uh, but there is a personality disorder called a dependent personality disorder. And I haven't really seen any research on this, but just in terms of the, the way it shows up, right? Here's a person who, feels like they can't make any decisions and anything that you say is a better decision and you know I'm going to call you if I need to figure out what I'm going to eat tonight for dinner even though you live in Miami and it, like what do you know right uh, but I just don't feel confident in making that decision for myself so let me call my buddy who's you know uh, <laughs> good at making decisions and so uh, I have some wonder if, if that's that's connected but that's just my own uh, my own curiosity this this is something that we can see in the research uh, this is something maybe in the research but I haven't researched it so uh, if you know that'd be something I'd love to hear about uh, maybe in a future paper and then lastly we'll end with adjustment disorder uh, this is to me is a funny disorder in, in this grouping uh, only because all of these others are really intense in some way uh, PTSD, reactive attachment disorder, all of these uh, other four disorders are like, whoa, that's really, really serious. Um, but the adjustment disorder is, is the opposite, uh, at least in, in terms of how I've seen it used. What an adjustment disorder is, is it really is just saying, um, you've, something has changed in your life, something has changed, and to be honest, something is always changing, right, the day or the week or, you know, time of year it is, right? Something's always changing. Uh, but this uh, disorder says something has changed in your life and you were having a hard time adjusting to it. That's, that's the crux of it, really. Uh, the reason I kind of put a smile on my face when I think about it is because this is often the disorder uh, that therapists will use if they're seeing a client and they need to diagnose them with something, but they don't really need criteria for anything. Um, and so you, you've come in because you're fighting with your roommate and you know they won't keep the place as clean as you will and it's really just stressing you out and you just need somebody to talk to about it, right? I may not diagnose you at all, uh, but let's say you're coming in on insurance, right? You're using your, I don't know, 10 sessions a year. You're kind of just using them on this, on this thing. Uh, you don't want to pay for it, so you're using your insurance. Well, insurance requires that I put a diagnosis down. What am I treating you for? Uh, what is the thing that they're paying to help you get better from? Well, adjustment disorder. <laughs> uh, this person uh, has experienced a change in their life, right? They've got a new roommate or their roommate suddenly got messy or whatever it is, we can make it a change and they're not adjusting well to it. The fact that they've got this new roommate or this roommate has suddenly become messy has made them anxious and so we're working on pulling down those anxiety symptoms. Uh, you get a new job, you lose a job, right? It could be stuff that would, that would or could at least lead to one of the other disorders. It could potentially lead to depression. It could potentially lead to some type of anxiety disorder, but you didn't get there. You didn't meet the criteria. Uh, you were a little bit sad and you were having trouble eating, but you didn't meet any of the other criteria or 
uh, you were a little bit anxious when you woke up in the morning, but you didn't meet any of the other criteria. And so uh, if I couldn't diagnose you with something, but I can identify what it is that we're talking about. I can identify that you came in because roommate issue, parent issue, had a baby, you know, even, uh, you know, like lost a pet or something like that. There's kind of a different one for that. But uh, anything that's there's this life event and, and you're having a hard time with it, this is a great um, disorder to, to make use of uh, in that way. Not to talk about it as just strategy, but I also think it's helpful to have something in the DSM that says like, yeah, we sometimes go through stuff and it makes us feel away, we get anxious or depressed, but uh, it's just about the adjustment. It's just about moving uh, through that, learning to work it out with your roommate, getting used to having a place that's a little bit messier, um, getting used to the new job, whatever it is. Uh, but it's just about the adjustment and we can still treat and work on that and recognize it. But um, clinicians, at least, I would say, understand that this is, you know, this is mostly usually just somebody's going through something in their life and it's relatively normative, uh, I would say. Uh, in most cases, because when it gets to the point of trauma or when it gets to the point of depression, we're just going to give you a depression, uh, trauma, or anxiety diagnosis. So <clears throat> in this place, it's probably just a phase of life, just something new. Uh, and that's something we can work on. It's something we can bill for. So uh, you don't have to pay for it out of pocket. Uh, but um, I do still think it's funny uh, just being placed in you know PTSD. If you watch that little girl video, you understand what I mean, uh, and then we get to hear where it's kind of like, yeah, I don't know, just fighting with my roommate. <laughs> all right, uh, that's it, okay, so that's all of the uh, trauma, anxiety, OCD, it took us a long time uh, to get through these, my ambitious self thought we'd get through it in one week, <laughs> but we didn't, so three weeks later, here we're done, um, and that's okay, um, because I think this is still a good time for you guys to get that paper started, which is the test. Uh, for this section. So we will in the future talk about other disorders uh, in these lectures um, but but for now I just want you to know that you can use any of those Axis 1 disorders like I said for uh, for your paper. So it doesn't have to be something that we've already covered. You can use one of these anxiety, trauma, OCD uh, disorders but if you want to look ahead to schizophrenia, you want to look ahead to uh, dissociative sexual disorders, uh, something like that that you just find interesting, uh, be my guest. No personality disorders, no intellectual dis disabilities, no nothing from uh, access to. Um, you've been told, okay? So uh, if you get a different grade because you did a personality disorder, you've been told. I'll see you next time.